podium now. Just give me a moment here, Julia, so I can introduce okay. you properly. So Julia Simmons heads up community engagement at Netball Australia. The community engagement program won Netball, uh, won a community award at the 2015 Australian Multicultural Marketing Awards. And I think there's a lot of lessons and <coughs> practical tips you may be able to offer us, Julia. So Certainly thank you. Right. Yep, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, I'll start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Gaona people, pay my respects to elders past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us today. Uh, I, you've got public speaking, you can run a marathon, <laughs> you can play soccer, you're changing the lives of people in health promotion at the Cancer Council. So I hope you've got some business cards with you because <laughs> you're kind of the whole package. That was fantastic. And if you're nervous in public speaking, it doesn't show. So thank you and thank congratulations. You. Um, I'd also like to just say hello and acknowledge my Nepal South Australia counterparts, Megan, Lizzie, Amy and Rach as well. And also acknowledge that there is a former Australian diamond superstar in the room, Jenny Borlase, who, as a player, I used to look up to as a goal shooter. Um, so I'll just have my fan moment there as well. <laughs> I was pretty cool, I hope, in morning tea when I was talking to you, but I was having a moment on the inside. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed today's conversation, and um, I've, I've, I guess I've had a couple of reflections. I mean, I, I don't think you could set the, set the scene in a more profound way than what Stan spoke to us about this morning. Um, but then to hear the questions and then to have the last panel members as well, the overall sort of theme I'm getting is this great, in, great intent and, and great intentions and the will um, and the desire to do more um, um, and to, to say more, um, but perhaps a degree of uncertainty about the best way to do that. Um, I'm just going to ask for a question that I um, asked before about um, the amount of us who are working in full-time permanent positions in your organisations that f only focus on diversity and inclusion. You might be an Aboriginal support officer, you might be a multicultural um, community worker. Can you vote just so we can... Just getting the lay of the land a yep. little bit. <laughs> <coughs> I have an idea of the answer, but I just want to see. We can move on from that. Um, the outcome, I think, um, that might come up, and I'm going to sort of predict the future a little bit here, um, is that we all know sport. We're all employed in our roles, whether it's at local government level. Um, yeah, OK. Oh, that's great. Well, so. The, the reality is we, we, we work in sport. We know a lot about sport. We're expo experts in our sporting field. But the diversity and inclusion space that we so often work in and operate in can be incredibly challenging, particularly when it's only part of your role. Um, so it's fantastic to see that 26% 20, of the role of full-time permanent employed, not based on government funding, <laughs> going to keep going. That is 12, oh, 20. Someone went, wait. <laughs> Did I say permanent? I meant till the end of funding. <laughs> 20, and I hear you on that one, 20% there, that's, look, this is the reality of the landscape that we're dealing with. So many of us are juggling, um, say, a, a sport development or a game development role as well as a high performance role or perhaps a separate high performance role. We might be in communications and marketing, we might be um, chief operating officers, we might be in finance, and for many people, oh, and she or he also looks after diversity and inclusion. So if there's a question that comes into your organisation that is anything other than white, um, heterosexual people playing sport, it comes to you. And you're expected to be an expert in all of these fields, um, whether it's um, working with LGBTIQ communities or whether it's um, working closely with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities or um, working with recently arrived migrants or refugees. It can be completely overwhelming. And I guess what I'm just going to try and do is, is get to the guts of it, which is that diversity and inclusion is about people, it's about relationships, um, and it's about turning that good intent that we're all sitting here feeling after being inspired by people like Ruth and our panellists before into action. So I don't pretend to know all the answers. <laughs> Let me put my hand up right there and say I'm, I'm by no means the expert. Dr Paul Oliver, on the other hand, just to throw him down the gauntlet, should know every, he is a doctor. Um, 
and I am teasing. I bought it online. You bought it online. <laughs> there you go. Um, so we're just hoping we can give you some tangible things that you can walk out of this room with going, okay, look, I don't know everything, but I've got five ideas that I'm really going to give a crack when I get back to my workplace and when I get back to my sports club. So that's what we're going to aim to do. Right, Paul? That's right. That's right. Okay. <laughs> um, so my presentation is about the learnings that we've had um, at Netball Australia through the One Netball program, a bit of a reflection of <coughs> those learnings in the three and a half odd years that I've been doing it and then, and then trying to turn that list into actions. And I come at it from a really positive spin. I mean, the fact that we're even having this conversation with this many people, 10 years ago, five years ago, I don't know that that would have been happening. I'm not sure how long this conference has been running for, so pardon my ignorance. But at the end of this week, there's a conference in Victoria um, where I'm based in Melbourne, but I'm from Sydney originally. And there's a conference in Melbourne next week called Sport, uh, that Sports Without Borders runs every year. So again, an annual fixture talking about diversity and inclusion in sport and what we can do and, and to inspire and to, and to bring about change. So I come at it from a positive spin because I do think that things are changing. And even that 26, ooh, 20 20 percent um, is a far cry from what it was, I think, even three and a half years ago when I came into this role. Um, I didn't have, I barely had any counterparts in other national sports organisations who were looking after diversity and inclusion. So that's a really exciting thing. Now, let's see how we go here. I'm just going to keep pressing buttons and hope that one of them, oh, here we go. So um, you've all got one of these on your, on your table. So in terms of the actual actions takeaway, so this is our inclusion action plan. We've been conducting connected clubs and communities workshops across Australia for the past two years. And what they are is having a face-to-face -face conversation <coughs> with clubs and associations about inclusion. What is it? What does it mean? What's the difference between inclusion and diversity? Oh, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I work full, oh, volunteer full-time at this club. I'm running the tuck shop. I'm managing my umpires. I'm pulling volunteers together. I don't have time for all of this. What does this even mean? So what we tried to do with this inclusion action plan is answer the call of, I don't have much time, or this isn't my full-time job, I need some short, medium and long-term wins to get me started. So short-term things I can do tomorrow, medium-term things we can work towards as a club this year, and long-term things that might take you a wee bit longer, but you can have bubbling around in the end at the back of your mind. So there's 70 action items in this inclusion action plan. We have ruthlessly pilfered from Play By The Rules, um, the seven pillars of inclusion concept, um, and tried to apply that framework um, to everything that we do. And so this is what it looks like at a club or um, association level. Again, have to bring Paul Oliver back into the mix here because he, co he pretty much wrote it. So we've worked with Paul really closely to create this document and to create a whole lot of other e-learning tools um, uh, and resources for our netball community that we hope will start to break down some of those barriers to even starting to have the conversation about inclusion and diversity. So that's, um, that's a really sort of exciting, exciting piece of work come to life. Again, f feel free to pilfer it yourselves. Um, if you're looking for that tangible set of giveaways to give to your clubs or associations, um, something as simple as, you know what, just start by putting the racism it stops with me poster up, it's free get it from the Australian Human Rights Commission, get it with an athlete from your sporting coach, just put it up in your clubhouse. Really simple step. Is it going to change the world? No. But what it does do from the day that it wasn't there to the day that it was, all of a sudden people go, oh, that wasn't there yesterday. Oh, okay, maybe this gives you an opportunity to start a narrative with your club about your expectations and your code of conduct and into your member protection policy. So that's just one example. There's 69 other examples in there, so have a look. Actually, there's probably 76, because we put some expert ones at the back for, um, for some people at, playing along at home. Um, I don't want to go into the... I don't want to give the big spiel about One Netball today. Um, this is it in a nutshell. It's part of Netball Australia's strategic priority to ensure that everyone in Australia values their connection with netball. Main emphasis on, the word, on that phrase being everyone everyone, regardless of background or ability. So it's written into Netball Australia's, not just Netball Australia's diversity and inclusion subset group down here, underpins everything that we do. So it's not just my role as the general manager of community engagement to go and tap people on the shoulder and say, hey, um, that test series coming up, 
that protocol that we wrote around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, flag flying protocol and acknowledgement and welcomes of country. Have you written, so that's, that's, it's embedded into our events guys event manual now. So they don't talk to me about it, which is great. It happens, it's embedded in their program. And unfortunately, it sounds a bit morbid, but I sort of subscribe to the, if I get his, hit by a bus tomorrow, school of thought, will this keep happening? So um, I'm gonna go into some of our key, or some of our key learnings, embedding everything you do, so it's an all of organisation perspective is, is critical. I won't read through the one netball aims, and you'll see there from 2012 to 2016, we're constantly learning and we're constantly evolving. And 2012 to 2013, sort of the starting point for one netball because that's when I, that's, that's when I started. So up until then, it had sort of been an idea that had been developed and then we moved through those different cycles of piloting, of, of mapping out existing activity, of moving into implement, implementation delivery phases. And now in 2016, and as I was talking to the, the gang at Netball SA about yesterday, what's next? What, what, do we, what is the best use of funding and resourcing what little we have? How do we best point that in the direction of our strategic outcomes? So that's, that phase, that question is still being answered. So. Don't ask me a question about that in the break because I don't have it just yet. I've got eight states and territories that I'm working through that with and it's very different from one corner of the country to the other. Again, the, you'll see a theme of the seven pillars of inclusion from Play By The Rules here. This is the way we approach our inclusion work at Netball Australia. So understanding that all communities need specific initiatives that are relevant to them, that cater for their um, specific needs and understanding addressing their specific barriers to participation in our sport, we apply these six um, sort of main areas that we address. So capacity building, C capacity building of our existing netball community with this document, e-learning, unconscious bias training, um, and delivering that at a national state and wherever possible, a localised level as well. So building the capacity of our existing netball community, so if we have a whole lot of new people coming to our sport, we want them to have the confidence and the knowledge and the know-how to open those doors. No point in having the best program in the world if you drive everyone to a clubhouse with a locked gate. So that's, a, that's probably, of everything, to be honest, one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle for us. But also building the capacity of new communities to netball to empower them to run sustainable programs themselves. So upskilling your coaches, your umpires, um, to run programs themselves and for their own communities um, and for, for the netball community as well is critical. Partnerships, um, working with like-minded organisations at all levels, um, communication, not just what you say, how you say it, who you say it to, what images you use when you're saying it. It's, it's a massive piece of that puzzle. Um, leadership, we're really lucky. We're a national body. We have 360,000 registered players. We have a huge community that's much bigger than that of, of ex extended family who are standing on the sidelines every week, of people who are involved in and around netball. And we have an opportunity as a predominantly female sport to lead. And that's, that's, a, that's a privilege and that's a wonderful opportunity for us to do some wonderful things for women in sport. Evaluation and research, you've got to measure what you're doing, you've got to monitor what you're doing, um, and making decisions based on evidence, not just based on anecdotal, oh yeah, we think there's a large community of Indian people there, maybe, oh, because, why is that? Oh, because I see them there all the time. W w what's the rigour there? You could go onto the ABS website tomorrow and look at your census data and get LGAs drilled down to the top 10 emerging communities in a particular LGA. So make your decisions based on evidence. Um, and we've, we've tried very hard to work with all our staff on the ground in different states and territories to encourage them to access those tools, most of which are free, um, to make sure they're making evidence-based decisions. And then policy. Um, you remember protection policies our reconciliation action plan, actually putting inclusion into action in the form of policies. So this is, this is my reflection. Um, these, are, these are my learnings, and they don't look too polished, as you'll see. But these are the top six things I think if I were to, if, when I was reflecting on what I could try and impart, um, uh, and not in a condescending way, um, but these are my sort of six reflections about creating meaningful change because there's change, there's sustainable embedded change um, and that's what we should all be aspiring to create. So I'll go through these in a little bit more detail. Know your why. So why are you doing this in the first place? 
being able to talk about why you are working in the inclusion and diversity space, why you are seeking out a particular community to work with. And this is our why. Part of it, yes, um, hopefully we're way past it, but some people just want to feel good about helping people. Um, Flick was talking before about the, um, the warm and fuzzy, you know, the pity party. Um, look, that's perhaps one way of looking at it. But this is a business case. If this is what Australia looks like, so this is based on ABS data and a few other sources. If you are not talking to 75% of the community, uh, to the 25% of the community who were born overseas, or almost 50% of the community who have at least one parent who was, if you are not speaking to your community who speak a language other than English at home, if you're not speaking to your 3% and increasing Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, if you're not speaking to 4.2 million people with disabilities, you're missing a pretty epic part of your market share. So the business case around that's fairly clear. And some of the sports who are doing it in a more sophisticated way are actually carving out particular multicultural groups based on their socioeconomic background, based, based on their um, ability to translate to high performance players. So, this is our business case. The other part of this is that every bit of research, go to the Diversity Council of Australia, every second day there's an article about how having a more diverse workforce um, makes you more profitable. Again, comes back to this. If you're having a conversation about a challenge that your business is facing and you are hearing from this, you're hearing voices and life experiences from this many people instead of this many people, well, it makes sense that without diversity of thought, you're not perhaps going to get some of that innovation that we know, apart from being a buzzword, is so important in where our sports are heading. Seek first to understand. Look, this sounds really obvious, and I don't want to tell you how to suck eggs, but it's a really important thing to actually carve out and say, we don't know what we don't know. So if, for example, you know, you were looking to run a program with a particular multicultural community because of an LGA where they are in proximity to one of your clubs or associations, it's okay to say, look, I'm not quite sure, I'm going to do my research and get back to you. Listen when you have those conversations. Resist the urge to interrupt. It's really hard sometimes, particularly when people might have views about your sport or their experience in your sport that you want to justify away that you want to say, oh, yes, 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 I know that's probably been your experience in the past, but don't worry, just, just listen, just listen. Um, find alternate views and look beyond your own backyard. Actually seek out. Don't be afraid of alternate views or, or um, views that you might not like because you've got to hear them. You've got to hear the good, the bad and the ugly to make an informed decision. Gather your evidence base, like I mentioned. Learn and listen to other sports. Just quietly, could you imagine a room like this um, if we were talking about participation products or high performance, would we be sharing warts and all stories about those things in that highly competitive space of high performance and game development? Yeah, probably, well, maybe, we would, maybe you would. Maybe, cross my fingers and hope that maybe that would be the case. But I found that in the inclusion and diversity space in sport, people are really happy to share because ultimately the outcome is the same for everyone. We want everyone who struggles to get access to our sporting codes across the board to have better access. Um, and as you can see before, we're not the best resource that'll pocket a sport, so we're all the better for sharing our stories and our lessons. Um, like I said, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and improve your own data collection. So data collection's the holy grail. We all have databases that we protect quite fiercely, but actually getting an understanding of who's playing your sport is critical if you're gonna make decisions on their behalf about the programs you run. So that's a huge part of it as well. Get advice. Um, would have cut myself out of these photos if I could. As you can see, I've got fairly basic PowerPoint presentation skills. Um, see how that photo at the front's in front of the other two? It took me about 20 minutes to figure that one out. Bring photo to front. Yep, I know it now. Um, we're really lucky with Netball that we've had some pretty awesome people with us on the One Netball journey since we started. So on your left, we've got our One Netball advisory group. Again, boom, Paul Oliver, there he is. Um, and Liz Ellis at the back, she was just, she's just a um, photo bombing. Um, but we've been really lucky to be guided by people who've been working in multicultural um, engagement and in resettlement services for decades. And they've seen every wave of migration in this country for, between these guys over the last 40 years. Um, and they were able to give us frank and really honest advice when we needed it at the beginning of our journey. Um, and to bring lots of insights from other sports that they'd worked with 
and to give some really fantastic advice about the aspiration for One Netball, where it could be, what we could do. Um, and we get together um, a couple of times a year and just laugh pretty much non-stop for eight hours, so that's always helpful. Um, the photo in the middle is our, um, with the exception of Josie Jance Dawson, who's missing in that photo, is our uh, RAP working group. And I'll go into that journey a little bit later, but actually having two Aboriginal women who played netball for Australia um, on that RAP working group, shaping, informing, advising um, the way forward for netball for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities has been one of the most um, profoundly important experiences for our sport. Um, and at our annual uh, um, awards dinner last year, our chair, the president of Netball Australia spoke about that. That one of, yes, it was a Netball World Cup year, we won the Netball World Cup, we'd had this really big year, we'd had record crowds and all of these things. But launching our Reconciliation Action Plan in October of last year, actually on that day, and inducting the first ever Aboriginal Hall, um, Hall of Fame recipient, Marcia Ella, into the Hall of Fame, was one of the most significant things that's ever happened for our sport. And then finally, the bunch of good-looking ladies on the right-hand side there is our um, Australia Post One Netball Ambassadors. So you mentioned, well, you would have heard before the phrase, you can't be what you can't see. The purpose with the One Netball Ambassadors was to provide a group of role models from across the country who could inspire our, not just our netball community, but well beyond that netball community, um, to create a more inclusive netball environment for everyone at all levels, from our clubhouse to Netball Australia. And we're re really lucky to have this group of just phenomenal women, you know, a speech pathologist by day, Queensland Firebird at night, you know, at, and we're in the sweet spot, at sort of the rise of professional netball at the moment, where we still have this group of amazing university-educated, community-giving women who are playing elite netball one day and then working in a childcare centre the next. Obviously, we want them to be full-time. In, in a very selfish way, I love the fact that I could send a speech pathologist or a, um, a, a social worker out to do some of our work in community, but one day, obviously, we want them to be fully paid, just focusing on their netball. Um, so, four, under-commit and over-deliver. Resist the urge to say yes to everything. Um, because particularly when you're in some meetings or you're meeting some people for the first time, you want to say, yes, 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 we can help with all of that. Yes, no problem. But then you get back to the office and think, oh, right, budget, time, resources, board approval, bureaucracy, and the list goes on. So again, back to that thing of sit and listen, process, and say, I'll come back to you. I've heard what you've said, I understand, and I'll come back to you. Build trust, respect, and integrity in your relationships. Um, S on the end, of course. Uh, this isn't just inclusion and diversity. This is people 101. You don't build strong relationships that don't have those things as central tenants to them. Um, and start small, but have a plan in mind. So you might start with a really small pilot program that might only have five kids in it. But as we've seen from what Ruth was talking about before, what might start as half a dozen people running a marathon that turns into 50-something within a few years, um, start small and do small well before you scale to the stars. And sharing stories. Um, I think this video will probably kick in. Um, but I just want to explain, so this is, this is Marcia Ella Duncan, OAM, first Aboriginal woman to play netball for Australia. And I think given the um, conversation today, it's really poignant to um, share this video with you. So as I mentioned, Marcia was inducted into the Hall of Fame in the athlete category last year for Netball Australia. <laughs> On that same day, uh, we launched our Reconciliation Action Plan. And when... My poor parents. I'll let her tell the story. In 1987, Marcia was part of the Australian team that finished equal runners-up at the World Championships in Scotland. When the team was announced, of course, the first thing I did was call my family. Um, and I think the whole family might have been at home waiting to hear. And I remember just screaming down the pub, getting a bit teary. I got picked, I got picked, you know, and I could hear the family just going mad. And as competitive as my family is, you know, my, my biggest supporters were my family. And so to hear all my brothers and a couple of sisters in the background screaming, uh, you know, God, it was like winning a gold medal. The 87 World Tournament in Glasgow 
again was another uh, journey for me. It was one of the youngest or least experienced teams for Australia to ever play the World Tournament. We had a, a, a week or two week camp uh, before we departed. We had that down at the Institute of Sport. We were playing superb netball. I think perhaps by the time some of us got to Glasgow, myself included, we were probably overdone. Um, I think we had peaked a little too early. But I know that we were really disappointed in the result that year. Still, it was just amazing. You know, I thought our nationals were pretty good. They were pretty good, but wow, the World Tournament just took it to a whole new level. Something that previous to Glasgow, I, I would never have been able to imagine. With 18 test caps to her name, Marcia Aller has made a significant contribution to Australia's on-court success in the international arena. Through her ongoing coaching of young Aboriginal people, Marcia continues to use her sport to promote individual and community health, self-worth and pride. I, I have always appreciated the tremendous opportunity that netball has given me. Not just to play netball, but for me to grow and develop as a person. Um, and I know that um, you know, compared to a lot of my peers, I have done exceptionally well in life, not just at netball. And I know that the difference between me and some of my peers was that I was off playing netball when they were off doing things that were dangerous to themselves or dangerous to others. And so I have always felt a tremendous sense of obligation, not to netball, but to my community. As soon as I retired at around 25, I started to work with Aboriginal kids because we've got all these little girls running around and all the boys are off playing football, but what are the girls doing? That's very personal. I do that because I understand what it did for me. And I would love the sport to be able to do that for other kids. Marcia Aller joins the Australian Netball Hall of Fame as a true pioneer of our sport. The first Indigenous scholarship holder at the Australian Institute of Sport and the first Indigenous athlete to represent Australia in netball. The most important thing is about how I can signal to the rest of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women that you can do anything. And not only can you do anything, but you can do it very well. And there is an opportunity for everybody who, if you want it, you can take it. Um, and, and so accepting the award for me personally, of course, is very rewarding. But for Aboriginal Australia, it, it is 10 times more important. Um, and I do think there is a really important message in there. I hope the message gets heard by a lot of people. Why wouldn't you share a story like that? Um, so that video came out the day before we launched our reconciliation action plan. It was then, we had our launch the next day. We had our awards <coughs> dinner that evening and that video played at the dinner. That's the clapping you can hear in the background. That's the, um, that wasn't you. Um, and the connection that people had with her story as a netball player was one thing because the bit that you didn't see before that, um, and it's on YouTube if you want to find it, is about her growing up in La Perouse in Sydney with all the Ella brothers. Um, perhaps some of the southern states might know, might not know the Ella brothers as a rugby union dynasty and, and league dynasty. Um, but growing up in that environment in La Perouse and what netball, the opportunities netball provided for her then. So that story is 10 times more powerful than anything that Netball Australia could tell. Um, and so that's where I'd really say and encourage you all to connect and identify with your community champions and let them be your champions. Build respect and build relationships and trust with those champions and, and support them and show that you're there for the long haul. <coughs> Working with Marcy has been an absolute privilege and what she is now giving back to the sport, what she has been giving back to the sport for years, but what she's doing for us at a national level with our RAP working group um, has been phenomenal. Um, Embedding diversity and inclusion, I mentioned to this to you before, it can't just be one person's responsibility because if that person goes the next day, where do your programs go? 
Um, I can't stress enough that education and awareness training has to be done by everyone, from your finance person to the person at reception who answers the phone, to your CEO and to your board. Um, initially, there's always, and I saw some of the words come up before, no board buy-in, struggle to connect with leadership, that kind of thing. We've been really lucky with Netball. I'm the first to admit it. We were incredibly lucky. We had a board that was supportive, an executive that drove it, and at our first Indigenous cultural competency session, it went for a full day. Everyone was out of the office at that session, and that's where our journey began. That was the watershed moment that had our finance lady say, OK, I didn't get it before. I get it now. And I know what sport can do as a vehicle, and I know what we have to do. So that's super important, and I can't recommend it enough. Unconscious bias training, if you get the right facilitator, is a great way for your organisations to start to become aware of the bias that you don't even know you have, but that you're hotwired to have. So even the person that thinks they're the most, you know, not racist, not homophobic, not sexist, everything, you are still hotwired to have unconscious bias. So become aware of it, accept that that's the first thing. Um, it's got to begin an induction. So when a staff member arrives at your organisation, have something, and I think Paul's going to talk about inclusion policies, have something that says what your organisation stands for. It doesn't mean you have to have all the answers, but have something that says this is an inclusive, welcoming environment. Set the standard, and then you'll be able to hold people accountable for that standard. We had a question before about, I think, John, you asked, you know, where do you get the courage to call people to account for the comments that you wish you could sort of, you know, that, that moment on the bus where you wish you could stand up and put your hand up and say stop just like before. If you outline what your standards are, what your expectations are, from the get-go, you're in a much better position to then say, that comment that you just made, whether it's informal or formally, depending on the nature of it, that comment you just made, um, if you go back and have a look at what you read when you first started here, that's out of line. And you, you'll have the confidence to call people on it because you'll have the structure and the policy around you to enable you to do that. Share your success with your colleagues. Like I mentioned, Adrian, head of finance in our organisation, doesn't go anywhere near sport dev. She's literally in a little filing cabinet enclosed computer world of spreadsheets, which scares the hell out of me. But whenever I finish a video, whenever we have something like that, I'll shoot it straight down to her and say, hey, what do you think? She's not from the sports world, so she doesn't bring the same lens. And I always get fantastic feedback from her and from lots of other people in our business that don't have anything to do with the day-to-day -day sporting stuff. Take them on the journey with you. Um, provide opportunities for them to, to contribute. We have a staff wrap um, network and we catch up once a month and we talk about a lot of the things that Stan mentioned this morning when, when everything was unfolding with Adam Goods. We talked about that um, when... Um, uh, what was going on with the Opals earlier in the year was going on. We spoke about that. We spoke about how easily that could happen. Could that happen in netball? Well, the answer is yes. Um, so we have honest conversations about um, topical issues that are relevant to people. Um, and then finally, be strategic. Um, don't just go, and I suppose this goes to the point before of evidence-based decision making, don't just run in hell for leather and say, yes, we're going to solve the world's problems. It's okay, you don't have to. But start with the strategy and work from there. So look, these are the greatest challenges for us moving forward, overcoming the fear of failure, and we all spoke about it before, the fear of saying something wrong to the point where you don't say anything at all. I think um, um, uh, Joey hit the nail on the head. Generally, we like to be very polite, and we don't want to start uncomfortable conversations, so we just don't have them at all. Um, and I think we need to, we need to tackle that. Um, sustainable long-term funding. Hey, that's the world we all live in. Pushing boundaries and comfort zones. It's an some of these conversations are uncomfortable to have, but you must have them. Supporting champions, people like Marcia, people like our ambassadors on the ground. Um, it's, it's crucial that they feel supported by you. Um, measure your social impact. Oh, look, that's a bit aspirational. I have to put it out there. That's um, something not even some of the best not-for-profits in this country can do. Um, so that's something we're working towards. And supporting a national direction. Like I said, we're, we're a member-based organisation. We have eight state and territory members who are all going completely different ways depending on where they're at and what they're doing. So that, they're our greatest challenges, and that's just being completely honest with you. That's what the future, what lies ahead for us. Um, now, I've thrown Lizzie Birmingham and Megan Vine um, under the bus a little bit here, but if you have questions about netball and inclusion and diversity in one netball in South Australia, they're your um, best points of contact, <laughs> and Amy, who's also, also just recently come on board as well. And there's my email address if you've got any questions or you've got any ideas or solutions to my problem, the challenges. Love to hear from you. Thanks very much. Thank you.